Right, morning everybody. So, we're going to look at Gaza conflict, prelude to global judgments. I guess every, every one of us is watching on the news what's happening in, in Gaza. And of course, it's sort of all happened before, hasn't it? There's been missiles being thrown from Gaza across into Israel before. Um, but here we are again. The difference maybe this time is that things are very tricky to resolve, aren't they? they uh, you know, it doesn't matter who's sort of getting involved. It's really hard for them to sort this out. Now, really what I wanted to do this morning is say, where does the Palestinian issue, i.e., you know, Hamas and the Palestinians, where does that fit in to the final global judgment of the world? So we know that there's a final global judgment coming, don't we? Because God's going to intervene, send Jesus, his son, back to the earth and establish a worldwide kingdom here on earth. And before Jesus comes back, there is worldwide judgment. And the Bible in many places talks about, um, you know, the sort of conflict that, 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 that's going to happen in the world. There's going to be all nations coming against where? Israel. Against Israel. So we know that's going to happen. Where does this Gaza <laughs> bit uh, fit in? If I was going to ask you, give me the one biblical word that sums up the final judgment, what word would you give me? Armageddon. Armageddon. That is exactly the word. And where would I go to read the word Armageddon? Because it's only mentioned once in the Bible. Revelation. Revelation chapter 16, verse 16, is the only time it says in the Bible the word Armageddon. But Armageddon, it talks in Revelation 16 about all these nations uh, converging in a great big conflict and basically coming down into Israel, though it doesn't necessarily say down into Israel in Revelation, but it does talk about Jesus coming back at that particular time. Now the world doesn't, if you said to the world about Armageddon, they probably don't really think of it as being a worldwide judgment from God. Some of them might even think of the Bruce Willis film called Armageddon, which was something to do with, I don't know, some meteorite hitting the world, I think, from memory. But Armageddon, from a scriptural point of view, is worldwide judgment. What's another way of us, what, what's another way of us uh, perhaps expressing Armageddon in, in, in sort of uh, 21st century language? What, what, what would the world call it that's coming up? World War. World War. And which world war would it be? Three. World War Three. So we've got the Third World War. Albert Einstein said, I, I don't know exactly when he said it, but probably in the 1930s or 40s, I guess, he said, I don't know what weapons are going to be used in World War Three, But I can tell you, he said, that World War Four will be fought with sticks and stones. And he's probably right, isn't he? Because this conflict that's coming is going to almost certainly involve weapons that are beyond imagination, really, um, if, if they do get used, which they might well do. Now, what this talk really is about is trying to explain the three stages of <coughs> World War Three. World War Three or Armageddon, isn't just one particular conflict and one event and it's over. When you look at the prophetical jigsaw puzzle of prophecy, then you find that there are different elements to this final judgment. There's stage one, stage two, stage three, and there's a gap between each stage, but really the gaps are not very big, and the whole thing together is the final judgment of the world. So, if I was to say to you, tell me the main sort of nation or nations that are going to be involved in invading Israel, which, which would be the main ones that come into mind? Russia. <coughs> Russia, okay. So we'll take, we'll take Russia just to start with. And I think Phil's right, most of us probably would say Russia is probably the main antagonist and the main event. Okay? And I think that's, that's fine. But I'm going to try and show you that, in fact, the Russia situation is stage two. 
the Russia situation with the nations that come against Israel is in fact coming after something else and before stage three. Now, in Ezekiel 38, we read about, um, we read about uh, this uh, situation of Russia coming down, and there are nine nations mentioned. So there's Magog, Meshech, Tubal, Rosh, Persia, Togomar, Goma, Ethiopia, and Libya. Those are the nations that are mentioned. And we'll look at this a bit more in a minute. Has anybody got any idea what stage one might be about? Right, the Palestinian situation. Now, what we've just read together is Psalm 83, which we're going to look at in quite a bit of detail in a minute. But in Psalm 83, there are ten tribes that are mentioned. Edom, Ishmaelites, Moab, Hagarites, Gebel, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, Tyre, and Assyria. They're almost all tribes, apart from Assyria, which is a nation. All the rest are pretty much tribes. So I think this... This is stage one of Armageddon. This is stage two of Armageddon. Any uh, takers for what stage three might be? Well, Christ's return comes at some point within any of these stages. We don't actually quite know. This is still conflict. Stage three is still more war. So there's another mm -hmm. war to take place, another stage to World War Three or Armageddon. Anybody know what that might be? Shall I tell you? Yes. <laughs> it's the ten kings headed up by uh, Rome, the papacy, and that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 17, and this is stage three. It is Europe and Rome attacking the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints when they are in Jerusalem and established in Jerusalem. That is nothing to do with stage two, and stage two is nothing to do with stage one, but they're all connected in effect, because what do each one of these stages have in common, do you know? They are all against Israel. These guys are against Israel, stage one, stage two are all against Israel, and stage three are all against Israel. But they're three different stages. What some have tried to do is mix up the stage three into stage two and stage two into stage one. They've almost tried to say it's one great big war all mixed together, and it just isn't. There are three distinct parts to it. Okay, so what I'm going to try and do now is prove to you that there are three stages to, to, to this. But just before I do that, let me just explain the motives behind each of these stages. Stage one, the motive is this. It's all about Israel's relatives. It's about the relations that Israel has got. And we'll look in a minute that Ishmaelites and Edom and Moab are all relatives of, of, of the Jews. All of them. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them in that list are uh, actually half-brothers and brothers of the Jews themselves. So this is Israel's relatives that there's a war with. Can somebody tell me what the main objective of stage two is? What's Russia all about when it comes down into Israel? To take a spoil. And what is spoil? Oil. Oil. Yeah. It's money. Mm -hmm. And to keep the work and to keep the R going, we've now got Israel's riches. Because that's what it's about, isn't it? So we've got Israel's relatives. That's what this part's about, Israel's riches in stage two. What do you think stage three is about? Is it about money? Is it about them being related? What's the objective of Rome, the Pope, heading up a war against Christ? It's against Christ as the king. It's against Christ as a king, but think of a word beginning with R that sums up what the Pope's about, coming against about Christ. Religion, isn't it? Israel's religion. We've got relatives, we've got riches, and we've got religion. That makes sense? Those are the three stages. And I tell you, it's not until the relatives have been dealt with, the, the power and the riches side have been dealt with, and the religion has been dealt with, that all of Armageddon has been accomplished and complete, and the kingdom is now completely established. 
but all three elements have to be dealt with. Does that make sense from a logical point of view? So, in Ezekiel 38, we've got nine nations. Remind me who they are. See if you can get all nine. In Libya. So we've got Libya, yeah. Persia, Persia. Oh, no. Gog is the man who heads yeah, it up, yeah, yeah. Togomar, Meshach, Tubal, Tubal. Ethiopia. Ethiopia, got pretty much most of them, so, well, didn't get that one, Magog, so Magog is southern Russia, I'll put all these on a map in a minute, Meshach is central Russia, Tubal is Eastern Russia. Rosh, uh, now it depends if you've got a modern version. If you've got the AV, you won't read the word Rosh. It will say, um, uh, to do, it, it, it will use the word chief, uh, chief prince, instead of it using the word Rosh. But many modern versions will say that that's an actual nation. It's uh, Rosh, which is northern Russia. We've got Persia, which is Iran. We've got Togomar, which is eastern Turkey. We've got Goma, which is Western Turkey. We've got Libya, which is North Africa. And we've got Ethiopia, which is North Sudan. Those are the nations, okay? Now, just to make one point here, uh, some Christadelphians, when they talk about this particular war in Ezekiel 38, because they try and wrap in the European religious war as well into this one, say, well, Goma... Well, let's, uh, because the people from Goma moved uh, over time, then potentially we could say that it's actually Goma is Europe, and therefore this is the European war as well. But it actually isn't. So, here's the clue to unlocking these places, right? It isn't where the people move to over time. How do we unlock where, where, where they actually you know, where the places actually are. It's where they were living at the time that the prophet was writing. That's the clue to all Bible prophecy. Otherwise, you'd struggle even with Israel. Because over time, have the Jews moved around the world? Yeah. Well, of course they have. So now where's the land of Israel? Because obviously if the people have moved, well, now Israel's in America or Israel's in Britain or Israel's wherever. You, it suddenly becomes meaningless if, pe if you're trying to track where people have moved over time. So it, it can't be, it just can't be where people have moved to, it's where they were living at the time of, that the prophet was writing. Does that make sense? So Goma, on any map that you look at to do with uh, uh, at the time that Ezekiel was living, was definitely Western Turkey. In fact, even in your Bibles, at the, in your maps at the back of the Bible, if you look at Goma, it will be in where you now see uh, East, uh, sorry, uh, Western Turkey. So let's put those nations on the map. Now, bearing in mind, all these nations, it says in Ezekiel 38, are coming against Israel, and they're coming to take a spoil, spoil to get riches. Now, here's the map. So anything in a very dark colour, in effect, has been mentioned in Ezekiel 38. So here's Libya. Now, Libya probably comes a little bit further across over here, which is why we've coloured in some of Algeria as well. Ethiopia is actually more to do with North Sudan, so that's here. There's uh, Persia, which is modern-day Iran. There's Togomar and Goma, which cover the whole of Turkey. And there's Mishe, Mago, Tubal and Rosh, which cover the whole of Russia, and maybe some of the um, um, republics as well that are around the edge of Russia as well, but certainly it's covering the whole of Russia. Okay? Now, all of those nations converge on Israel. If you're, and here's Israel, look, in red, in the middle here. If you're looking at that, does anything strike you as slightly odd when you look at that? None of them are attached on the border. None of them are attached to Israel. None of them. All of these nations here, in, in the middle here, none of them are mentioned. Where is Syria when Syria is an arch enemy of Israel? Syria actually is technically at war with Israel. There's no mention of Syria. There's no mention of Iraq. 
though Iraq doesn't actually border Israel. There's no mention of Jordan, no mention of Palestinians, no mention of Lebanon, no mention of any of those nations that are currently in some sort of conflict situation with Israel. But does that essentially strike you as odd? Yeah. does, doesn't it? And so what some commentators have said is, well, when it says Persia, perhaps it means a lot more than uh, Persia. But when you look at ancient Persia at the time that Ezekiel was writing, it wasn't a huge empire coming over here. It was very much the area that we now see as Iran. So to me, that is odd that those initial neighbours are not mentioned. The reason that they're not mentioned in Ezekiel 38 is quite simply that part one has already happened. Part one of the conflict has already happened by the time you get to <coughs> this stage here. So going back here, part one is Psalm 83, and who? Israel's relatives, their neighbours. Part two, which we've just looked at, is this here. All these nations on this outer ring. So in other words, there's an outer ring, but there's an inner circle here, which is stage one. Outer ring, inner circle. So we're going to have a look now at the inner circle, and I believe there are some key places, and Janet just mentioned one of them, which is Isaiah 17, to do with uh, uh, Damascus being destroyed. But a really key one is Psalm 83. So let's have a look. You might want to turn... Well, you might already be in Psalm 83. But um, Now, these generally are not nations. So what have we got? Call out to me, if you would, who, who we've got uh, here. Well, let's just, before we do that, just have a look at uh, what, what's going on. So verse 2 says, Lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent, they are confederates. In other words, they formed an alliance against thee. Now we've got the list of nations, or tribes. So who have we got? Edom. Edom. So we've got Edom, Ishmaelites, Ishmaelites Moab, Moab uh, the Hagarenes, or some of you might have Hagarites, it depends on your version. Uh, Gebel, again you might have a slightly different name for that in more modern versions, but we'll take Gebel, Ammon, Ammon Amalek, Amalek, Amalek Philistines, the Philistines, the inhabitants of Tyre, and verse 8. Asher. Now, right, so in the AV it says Asher, Ash, Asher, but in modern versions, what does it say? Assyrian. Assyrian. In, in the hundred or so times that it's translated, that is almost always in the AV translated as Assyria. For some reason, they didn't translate it as Assyria. Assyria is the right translation for that particular word, and Assyria is joined with them as well. Okay, so here they are, look. So we've got um, the tabernacles or the tents of Edom. We've got the Ishmaelites. We're going to look a little bit at these tents of Edom. It's interesting, it says the tents of Edom, isn't it? Why doesn't it just say Edom? It says the tents of Edom. Right, these are nomadic people, but we'll look, we'll look at that in a minute. Ishmaelites, who was Ishmael? Uh, yeah. Son, really. Right. Well, and a, and a, of, a, of Abraham. So Abraham's own yeah. son was Ishmael, but it was through the wrong woman, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. Should have been with Sarah. He, he he went with Hagar, and so there's. So are these people related? Yeah. Absolutely. Edom. Where did the Edomites come from? Esau. Was Esau related? He was, wasn't he? Because he was a brother of Jacob, who was the father of the Jewish nation, well, who began the actual, uh, with the 12 tribes of the Jewish nation. Moab came from Lot. Was Lot related? Yeah. Now, Moab became the nation of Jordan. So the nation that we now know as Jordan is Moab. 
By the way, the Ishmaelites are in the northern Saudi Arabian area at the time of Ezekiel. The Hagrites, that's another tribe. They are also east of the Jordan. So in the Jordan, uh, what we now know as Jordan in terms of the country. Gebel, they were a tribe. They were up in north Lebanon. Uh, Ammon, also a tribe, also in what we would now know as Jordan. So these weren't huge territories. They weren't great big kingdoms. So there's quite a lot of them, but not covering a huge geographical area. Amalek, now these were vicious uh, people. Um, and in fact, when Israel came out of Egypt, they were the first people that they fought a war with, um, always have hated Israel. They're not related to Israel, these guys. Amalek are not, you know, whereas Moab, Ishmaelites, Edom are related, Amalek aren't. But they actually were living in where, what we would now call southern Israel. Philistia, well, this is also a tribe. They were based in what we now know as the Gaza Strip. So the area that, you know, uh, Goliath was a Philistine, he came from that area. We would now call that the area of the Gaza Strip, which is where Hamas currently rules. Tyre was the capital city of a place called Phoenicia, which is actually uh, in Lebanon. So Tyre is based in Lebanon. But it's interesting that it's just the, the city that's mentioned, isn't it? It's not, again, a great big king. It never once says Lebanon. It actually is listing out here just the city or a tribe within Lebanon. Isn't that interesting? Why doesn't it just say Lebanon? It'd be a lot easier. It's because this is to do with individual people rather than a whole uh, kingdom against them. So this isn't, the, I believe, this isn't Lebanon as a country against Israel. It's pockets of people within Lebanon against Israel. Does that make sense? So, in effect, and interestingly, in Tyre, the city of Tyre, you could get a plane there today and go and, uh, you know, land in modern-day Tyre, which is exactly the same place as ancient Tyre. That is where the stronghold of Hezbollah is, which are, you know, have got the same mantra as Hamas, which is to do what? destroy Israel. Isn't that interesting in the light of Psalm 83, yeah? And lastly, we've got Assyria. Now, I'm going to show you more about Assyria in a minute, because this is astounding. But Assyria was once a huge empire, but at the time that Ezekiel was writing, it wasn't a huge empire at all, but it was a fairly substantial uh, nation. So that's a nation... Pretty much all of the rest of them are not nations, they're groups of people. Now, if we were going to put all of that on the map, this is what it looks like. So here's the northern kingdom of Israel. Here's the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, bearing in mind, roughly, when do you think Psalm 83 was written? Who wrote Psalm 83? David. Asaph. Asaph, right? Asaph wrote... Um, it wasn't David, it was Asaph who wrote Psalm 83, and he lived, give or take, 1,000 BC, so 3,000 years ago. 500 years, or roughly, before Ezekiel wrote. So, that's why, when it says on, on the map here, ancient political map of uh, Psalm 83, it's showing the kingdom, north Israel, south Judah, yeah? because that was the situation pretty much at that time. So look what we've got, there's Ammon, there's Moab, there's the Hagarites, there's the Ishmaelites, there's Edom, there's Amalek, there's Philistia, uh, up there is Gebel, there's Tyre. Now that looks very different map, doesn't it? So when David said, well, that none of them are actually joining on the borders of Israel, this is very different, because all of them pretty much do. In fact, not only do they sort of join borders, some of them are in amongst what we now know as modern-day Israel. They're in amongst them. Let me just cover, I haven't got time to cover all of these and the significance of all of them, but the first on the list was what? The tents of Edom. And where did I say Edom was? If we wanted to go to a country that was modern-day Edom, where would we go? Jordan. Now, have a look at this. The tents of Edom, right? 
Edom is Jordan. You see all these tents here? Well, they've, they, this is a more modern picture. The tents have been converted into more permanent sort of uh, dwellings. But what actually happened was, when Israel was created, a whole load of people that weren't really called Palestinians at that time, but a whole load of people that were living in Israel, scarpered out of Israel, because what did the Arabs do when Israel was first created in 1948? They attacked it. So there's now a great big war. So there was, with that war of the Arabs against Israel, there was a lot of people displaced, as there is, isn't there, when there's a war. So these, uh, what we would, that are, that are now called Palestinians, um, they basically, quite a number of them, fled Israel into Jordan to escape the fighting. And what Jordan did was created a camp for these people in tents. And that is a picture of the tents back in 1952, something like that. Huge camps were erected. And even when the war was over, Jordan never assimilated those people into their own country. They've kept them as refugee camps for 60 years. And today, one and a half million refugees remain in Jordan's 58 camps. They didn't want to assimilate them in. Why didn't they want to assimilate these people into their world? They're a political football. They're a political yeah. football. Exactly right. So they wanted to keep them in tents. So here we've got a whole load of tents in Edom. And these are people who would, the, the world would now call Palestinians. Interesting, don't you think? So it isn't the whole of Jordan... It's the tents of Jordan. It's these people in particular that, as John says, are the political football that are used to try and say, Israel, you need to get all these people back. And part of the peace agreement talks is, Israel, you need to accept one and a half million people into your little territory, um, you know, because actually they were displaced back then. Here's another interesting one. So that was the first on the list. This is the last on the list. So this, say, this is where your AV says Asser is joined with them, but modern versions say Assyria. This map here, this is a really amazing map. So you see this, uh, I, I went onto a website to say where at the time that Ezekiel was writing was Assyria. And there's lots of maps, and this was the clearest, and it shows a red blob there. So this red blob look covers some of Iraq, because <coughs> here's Iraq look, so, and obviously they were based in Nineveh, which was around here. And look where else it goes into. It goes into the northern part of Syria, and actually some a little bit into southern Turkey there. But you see that sort of shape here? That was exactly what Assyria was when Ezekiel was writing. Now have a look over here. See this red blob here? Does that look pretty much identical to yeah. this red blob over here? Yeah. It's pretty much the same, isn't it? And this red blob here has only just come onto our maps. It never existed about a month ago. Because what is that red blob? ISIS. ISIS. Yeah, and who's ISIS? Extremist um, Muslim. Extremist Muslim. They are that extreme that Al-Qaeda won't have anything to do with them. That is how extreme these guys are. They're unbelievable in their extreme. They're crucifying people. It's the most violent and extreme organisation that the world probably has seen since ancient Assyrians who were also exactly of the same character. They video the beheadings of, 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 of people and post them up, say, look what we do, look what we do. They killed 270 people just a few days ago in uh, North Syria, beheaded all of them. They're ultra, ultra extreme Muslim fanatics. And they have set up a caliphate, which is a kingdom called the Islamic State, which is here. And do you know something? The world's done nothing about it. Not a thing about it. Isn't that amazing? Why hasn't the world done anything about it? Well, they've got a lot to worry about at the minute. They've got Ukraine on fire. They've got Israel on fire. They're just thinking, well, what, America says, well, we've been in Iraq once. What's the point of doing anything else? Oh, we just leave them to it. But the Bible says these very guys help these guys around here. Now, does that sort of add up? Yeah. Sort of does, doesn't it? 
do, do you think these people love the Jews? They're killing their own brothers. What would they do to the Jews? It's incredible. So here's another map showing you the same sort of thing. So again, there's Assyria. There's that blob up there, exactly the same. This is a totally different website showing you exactly the same territory of uh, Assyria up here. Um, and here in all these different multicolors are all of these tribes and all of them are surrounding Israel or in amongst Israel. And of course the key ones for us are the Philistines, which are the Palestinians uh, in the Gaza Strip. And we've got Tyre, which is Hezbollah. And you've got all these other people. So you've got also Palestinians living within Israel, haven't you, that are rioting and uh, trying to kidnap and cause mayhem at the moment. And there's, there's obviously some people that are in Jordan that are also Palestinians that are also going to, uh, you know, cause some trouble. And maybe more than just uh, those people living in those tents, but other people as well. So we come back to here. And now this, this gap's now filled in, isn't it? Exactly filled in. Now some people say this question. Is, is, is Psalm 83 actually talking about conflict? Because when you look at it, it's it sort of, I don't know what you think, but when you read it, it says, you know, they've sort of consulted together, they're confederate against you, but it doesn't actually talk about there being an actual war. It talks about them sort of... Right, and here, so I was going to ask that question. What is there in Psalm 83 that makes you think this is more than just people getting together and making a noise, that there is actually conflict? Mm -hmm. And I think the word tumult... Um, well, first of all, in verse 4, we've got come, let's cut them off from being a nation. They, they obviously have got huge intent to destroy Israel. Uh, and secondly, now this is amazing, look, the word tumult there is actually the Hebrew Hamas. So the Hebrew for the word tumult is the word Hamas. And the word Hamas in, is, in Hebrew means to rage, to war, and to be an uproar, which is why they've translated it as tumult. Does that sound like there is action? Yeah. Sounds like it, doesn't it? They lifted up the head. So this is like somebody rising up. This isn't somebody lying down. This is somebody now. It's action. They've lifted up the head. It's a biblical expression that says, you know, there's now, there's now action. And finally, there's a confederacy. There's an alliance in verse 5 where they've all sort of come together. So it sounds to me like that there is conflict here. Now, I need to tell you about this, because this starts getting, I think, like really interesting. So, look what he says now in verse 9. Do unto them as unto the Midianites, please. So this whole conflict and war, can you please sort them out, God, like you sorted out the Midianites? And then he mentions some people. As you did with Sisera... As you did with Jabin at the brook of Kison, which perished at Endor, they become as dung of the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, yea, all their princes as Zebar and Zalmunna. <laughs> Anybody heard of those names? They're not like popular biblical names. Like you don't name your child, you know, Oreb or uh, Zeb. What should we call a kid? Oh, let's call it Zeb. It's a good name. No, you wouldn't call it Zeb. It's a bad name. So. Who are these people? Do you recognise any of those names? So we've got Sisera, Jabin, Oreb, Zeb, Zeba and Zalmunna. Do you recognise any of those names at all? Sisera. Sisera? Yeah. What do we know about Sisera? Yes. 100% right. He was killed with a tent peg through his head. Now, let me... Um, tell you a little bit about these guys because basically it's quite amazing that um, this Asaph um, prophet has written down about these four people because it tells us the whole story. Sisera was an army captain. He was the army captain in Judges chapter 4. We'll look at that in a minute. 
Jabin was king of Canaan, and Sisera reported in to Jabin. So in other words, Sisera was, was his army general, and he was the main king. They, he was the king of Canaan, all right? And both of them are mentioned in Judges chapter 4. The nobles like Oreb and Zeb are mentioned in Judges chapter 6, and princes like Zebar and Zalmunna are mentioned in Judges chapter 6 as well, and that's the only time these people are ever mentioned in just these couple of places. Interestingly, of course, at the time of the judges, did they have a king? No. 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 There was no king. A bit like Israel now, isn't it? Where there's no king, there's no king. So the time of the judges is actually quite a, a similar time to the time that we're in now, with no king. So let's have a look at what's going on here. So let's have a look at this military general Sisera and King Jabin of Canaan. So th there's the picture that John remembered. There's this nice lady hammering a temp peg through his head. <laughs> pleasant, but this guy wasn't very pleasant. So come and have a quick look at uh, Judges chapter 4. Now look how it starts. This is the chapter that's got these guys in, okay? How does it start? Right, so the children of Israel did evil. That's how it all starts off. The children of Israel did evil. Then we've got, um, in verse 2, the fact that Jabin actually conquered Israel. So in verse 2 it says, The Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was uh, uh, Sisera. So Israel is conquered by these people. Why? Why? Because Israel was evil at that time. Now it says in verse 3 that Sisera ruthlessly oppressed the Jewish people, the Israelites. Uh, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. That word mightily oppressed me, and he was absolutely ruling them with a rod of iron, literally, with chariots of iron. Okay, so Israel's in big trouble here, would you say? And so they turn back to God. So we've just read that in verse 3. The children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Verse uh, 14, finally, there's a bit of stuff that happens in between. But when you come to verse 14, it says, Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out from bef uh, gone out before thee? Okay, so basically, Sisera is going to be handed over to the Lord uh, by the Lord God to the Israelites. Why do you think God is doing that? Why is Israel now getting the victory at this point? Because they've turned back to God. Okay, so that's verse fourteen. Point number six is Syria is then killed. Sisera is not uh, Syria. Sisera is then killed. This is in verse twenty-one. So have a look at that. So Jael, Heba's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand, went softly unto Sisera and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it to the ground. This guy is dead. <laughs> he is seriously dead. She's she's hammered a peg through his head. That's how terrible that is. And in verse. Uh, 24, Sisera's boss, the king of uh, the Canaanites, is also killed. So we've got verse 24 of chapter 4. And the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they destroyed Jabin, the king of Canaan. All right? So remember this pattern. Israel evil, Israel conquered... Israel oppressed, Israel cries to the Lord, Israel then gets victory, uh, and Israel's enemies are destroyed. Okay? What were the other people that we were told about in Psalm 83? These, there were these military commanders called Oreb and Zeb, which we've all probably never really heard of, and kings Zebar and Zalmunna of uh, Midian. So these guys appear... Just a couple of chapters left uh, later. So have a look at Judges chapter 6. How does it all begin? Can you believe it? Yeah. Just two chapters have gone by, and it all starts off saying, 
the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. It's happening again. It's only two chapters, and they've already gone back to being evil against God again. Israel was conquered by uh, Midian. It says that in verse 1. The Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. Israel, it says in verse 2, were living where? In caves. They were living in dens, caves. Are these people in trouble? Yes. Like you don't go and live in a cave if you've got a nice house to live in. So these people, Israel is absolutely in dire straits at this point. And in fact, in verse 6, it says Israel was greatly impoverished by these guys, these Midianites. Israel, surprise, surprise, in verse 6, what do they do? They cry to the Lord. They're in bad trouble. They now cry to the Lord. Israel finally gets victory in chapter 6 of, uh, and verse 16. I, look, the Lord says, I will smite the Midianites. Excellent. Then in chapter 7, verse 25, we get finally all Reb and Zeb that are mentioned in Psalm 83 being killed. So that's in verse uh, 25. They took the two princes of the Midianites, all Reb and Zeb, and they slew them. They're gone. And finally, the other guys that were got rid of were Zebar and Zalmanah. They're killed in chapter 8 and verse 5. Um, and they're finally killed in verse 21. Then Zebar and Zalmanah said, Rise thou and fall upon us, for as the man is, so, so is his strength. And Gideon arose and slew them. Okay? So, watch this. Okay? Judges chapter 4. Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 4, Israel's evil, Israel's oppressed, Israel's weakened, Israel turns to God in desperation. God intervenes, Israel's enemies destroyed. Happy with that? Yeah. Then there's a gap of two chapters. Starts all over again. Israel's gone evil again. Israel's oppressed, Israel's weakened, Israel turns to God in desperation. God intervenes, Israel's enemies are destroyed. Now, we go back to our crucial chapter of Psalm 83. Is it beyond the realms of possibility that we've got the same pattern working here? Yeah. We've got Israel evil, Israel oppressed, Israel weakened, Israel turns to God in desperation, God intervenes, Israel's enemies are finally destroyed. Would that sort of make sense that the same pattern might happen here? Now we know who Israel's enemies are, because we've just spent like 20 minutes looking at the people that are mentioned in Psalm 83, the tabernacles of Edom. So we've got the Palestinians, we've got Hezbollah, we've got Hamas, we've got all those people that are listed out here word for word in Psalm 83, which are the very people currently firing rockets into Israel. So let's just bring it up to date. Here we are in 2014. Let's suppose that this same pattern is going to go through and work its way straight through as we see it happening now. Okay. Would we say that Israel at the moment is godless? We know they're God's people, but are they, are they godless, would you think? There's two key things. I mean, all men are godless. So everybody sins. We understand that. But in God's sight, are his people on side with him or not. And I think there's two key things that say that they're currently not. One is this. Um, this was a couple of years ago. New poll shows atheism on the rise with Jews found to be the least religious nation on the earth. So, so, so this report said. And that was a Gallup poll. Well, it wasn't on the earth. It was 57 countries, actually. So out of 57 countries, Israel was the least religious of all of them. How amazing is that? Is that so these people are not following God. In fact, at least half of them are just complete atheists. The other point is 60% of Israelis say that the settlement should be removed. What does God think about the removal of settlements from the land that he has brought them back into? Not a great deal. He's brought them back in, and yet two-thirds of them say, well, let's give it back again. It's not theirs to negotiate with. So I think we're here, yes, are Israel's enemies rising up? Remember that we had in the other instances, uh, that, that, well, I think they're certainly beginning to. So here's the headline just a couple of days ago, Israeli-Gaza conflict. Now look what's happening. Hamas calls for third intifada. 
the third intifada. We need another uprising here. It's calling in its uh, allies and so on. They haven't really responded yet. There's been a few rockets from Lebanon, but not too much as we stand here right now. But do we think that they are going to, at, one, at some point, whether it's following this conflict or, or not, I don't know, but at some point, will they? Yes. Well, yeah, because Psalm 83 says they will. Now, here's the multi-million dollar question. In all the other instances, Israel was oppressed. They were severely oppressed, so they ended up in dens and caves. They were in big trouble. Would we say that Israel's like that at the minute? Yeah. I don't yeah. think we can, because they're still ultra-confident in their own weaponry. They're not turning to God. We, we, we'll defeat them. We'll literally rain down missiles and, de, you know, de, and, and destroy. So then they haven't been oppressed yet. They haven't been weakened yet. They are still seeing themselves as ultra-strong in their own ability. Israel, have they turned to God in desperation? Certainly no way close to that yet. Has God intervened? No. Are Israel's enemies destroyed? No. But can you see this pattern is going to happen at some point. And this that's going on at the minute could be the spark that actually does bring around conflagration between Israel and its immediate neighbours, the like of which Israel hasn't seen before, that actually does get them into a serious amount of trouble. Now, could that happen? Well, it could happen, couldn't it? At the minute, Hamas throws in its inaccurate little rockets here, there and everywhere, but these guys, Hezbollah, have certainly got a lot more about them in terms of their miss. They're not just rockets uh, in, with, with Hezbollah, they're missiles. They caused a huge amount of devastation back in 2005. If these guys get involved properly, then Israel really is in trouble because they've got it coming in every which way. And if this guy gets involved, Syria, which of course, linking back to Assyria in Psalm 83, means that almost certainly Syria will be getting involved, and uh, only recently he's threatened to attack Israel, then we've really got problems, because this guy's got scud... These guys have got rockets, these guys have got some missiles, and the, the, this guy has got, still got chemical weapons and uh, scud missiles and all the rest of it could cause a huge amount of damage. So here's what I think happens next. Israel's surrounding neighbours do get drawn into the conflict. Israel's greatly weakened by this conflict. It wins, but it's weakened. And Israel will end up destroying its surrounding enemies. It will win through desperation, turn, probably literally turn to God, and actually they'll defeat their enemies. All of these immediate neighbours are actually sorted out um, and removed for probably the first time in their uh, history, as it were. Now, at the same time, this happens. So Isaiah 17 tells us that Damascus is going to be removed from being a city and become a fallen ruin, or a ruinous heap, it says in the AV. The one claim that Damascus has got, which of course is the capital of Syria, is that it's the oldest inhabited city on earth. It's never failed to be a city in all of its history over the millennia. And yet we're told in the Bible it will get removed. It will be completely destroyed. And look at this. Now, isn't this amazing? In the same chapter, it says, this is Isaiah 17, the fortified towns of northern Israel will also be destroyed and the royal power of Damascus will end. In that day, Israel's glory will grow dim. Its robust body will waste away. The whole land will look like a grain field after the harvesters have gathered the grain. Does that sound like Israel's in some trouble? So Israel wins because it defeats its neighbours with uh, huge uh, you know, uh, weaponry, whatever it decides to use, I don't know. But fundamentally, they're in trouble as well. So they win, but they're left weakened. That is still to happen. You can see the situation in Syria is building up to these uh, events as we see. So look, there is stage one. We've just covered off stage one. So... The Armageddon, World War III, that, we, that the Bible talks about in three stages. Stage one is Israel's immediate neighbours. That all gets sorted out. Israel's left weakened but actually destroys their, 
their, the, the, their enemies. So Israel's relatives, because remember we said that Israel's related to most of these people, they're half-brothers or brothers. It's amazing, most people in the world don't realise that these people are actually related to uh, Israel. But then we move into stage two. And stage two that we've already talked about are these outer ring of nations. So the inner circle has been dealt with. Now we're into part two, which is this outer ring of nations. Libya, Ethiopia, um, Iran, Turkey, and Russia are the countries then that come piling in. And do you know what? It all happens again. Just as it was happening twice in Judges 4 and Judges 6, after a while they went evil again, so this happens here. So, in effect, before Russia comes down, Israel becomes godless again. And I think at this stage, probably actually gives up some of the land in a peace deal. To, to make peace and to sort it all out once and for all, they actually physically do give away some land. Joel 3 says that the, the, their land gets divided. I think they possibly do do that. Israel's enemies rise up again. This time it's Russia and co. that we've already considered. Israel's oppressed. Russia comes straight through Israel. How many people are going to get killed in Israel? It tells us the number. Two-thirds. That's 4.5 4 million people are going to get killed when Russia comes through. Israel's weakened. Israel in desperation turns to God again. God now intervenes. Now this time... It's a massive intervention because who actually comes in at this point? Jesus. 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 I will show you that verse in a minute. And, and Israel's enemies are finally destroyed by God. It says, well I'll show you in a minute, exactly how they get destroyed. Now, amazingly, this piling in is mentioned in the same chapter of Isaiah 17 that talks about the destruction of Syria and uh, Damascus. At the end of this uh, chapter, it says, Listen, the armies of many nations roar like the roaring of the sea. Hear the thunder of the mighty forces as they rush forward like the thundering waves. Does this sound like stage two to you? In other words, there's an enormous vacuum that's being created in the Middle East. Israel has probably made some sort of peace agreement. It's really weakened. It makes some sort of deal. Its immediate enemies have just been wiped out, but it's left, you know, gasping for breath. What then happens into this vacuum some time after is this, these are nations depicted as waves coming thundering in to the space that was left. The big multi-million dollar question as well is, in Ezekiel 38, it says when Russia comes down, Israel's living safely and peacefully and everything sounds to be, seems to be okay. So how does Psalm 83 fit into that? Well, in our modern trans translation, the New Living Translation, I'm going to read you this and you tell me if this doesn't sound exactly like what, what we've just been talking about. So this is talking, this is Ezekiel 38 and it's talking about Russia and co coming down into Israel. In the distant future, you, Russian leader, will swoop down on the land of Israel, which will be enjoying peace after recovering from war and after its people have returned from many lands to the mountains of Israel. Does that sound like what we're just enjoying peace after recovering from war? You and your allies, a vast and awesome army, will roll down on them like a storm and cover the land like a cloud, and at that time evil thoughts will come to your mind. And you'll devise a wicked scheme. You'll say, Israel's an unprotected land filled with unwalled villages. I will march against her and destroy these people who live in such confidence. I'll go to those formerly desolate cities that are now filled with people who've returned from exile in many nations. I will capture vast amounts of plunder for the people who are rich with livestock and other possessions now. So whatever happens in the conflagration between, in Psalm 83, Israel still Southern Israel especially survives, because it was northern Israel that took the brunt of Psalm 83. Southern Israel's okay. And in fact, what do Israel now have that they didn't have just a few years ago? Gas, Gas oil. When my people are living in peace in their land, then you will rouse yourself. You'll come from your homeland in the distant north with your vast cavalry, your mighty army, and you will attack my people Israel. This is after... They've recovered from war and their immediate enemies have been sorted out. 
It's part two. Now God destroys the Russian army that comes down along with Iran and along with the other nations as well in a, in a miraculous and frightening way. It says in Ezekiel 38, I will punish you and your armies with disease and bloodshed. I will send torrential rain, hailstones, fire and burning sulfur upon you. That's how it, they, they're going to come to an end. Two slides to go. Look, we're told categorically that the Lord Jesus Christ will intervene in at this particular stage as well. Because in Zechariah 14, which is talking about the part two bit, it says, Then the Lord will go out to fight against those nations as he has fought in times past. On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. Then the Lord my God will come and all his holy ones, or saints it says in the AV, with him. So Jesus comes and lands on the Mount of Olives, you know, touches down on the Mount of Olives, at the very time that this great war is taking place between Russia and all these other nations that have come against Israel. This has got to be Jesus, hasn't it, on the Mount of Olives here, because Jesus took off from the Mount of Olives in Acts chapter 1, and the angels said, you'll see him come in exactly the same way as you've seen him go back to the Mount of Olives. And 500 years before Jesus even lived, we were told about his second coming here. But interestingly, look, who's with Jesus when he comes? Saints. The saints. What must that mean? The judgment has already happened for the saints. So somewhere between the beginning of Psalm 83, the conflagration of all the inner nations... The judgment has happened. It's got to have happened by the time God judges Russia here on the mountains of Israel, would you say? It must do because the saints are there. So the return of Jesus must have come at some point before that because the judgments happen. So we've got stage one, Israel's relatives. Stage two was Russia coming down for Israel's riches. And then... At the end of here, Christ is in Jerusalem. Christ is actually there with the saints. But what happens in stage 3? It's Revelation 17. This is the woman and the beast, symbolic of Rome and Europe, coming down and attacking the Lord Jesus Christ. It says that here, look. Together, the woman and the beast, Rome and Europe, go forth to fight against the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus. Jesus, but the Lamb will defeat them because he is Lord of lords and King of all kings. And look, and his called and chosen and faithful ones are with him. Well, of course they are, because they arrived at the end of uh, stage, stage two. So now there's a religious war. This isn't about money. It isn't about being a relative. This is a religious war. And so, at the end of that, all three stages of Armageddon have been sorted out. Israel's immediate relatives and the age-old hatred that's gone on for millennia has been sorted out. Israel's greatest foe, which in effect is uh, Russia, headed up by Gog. We see what Putin's doing at the minute. All of that's been sorted out. Riches, which were the motivator for that, and power have all been sorted out. And finally, the religious side has also been sorted out with the destruction of false religion uh, in the shape of Rome, and obviously supported by uh, Europe as well. And finally, and at long last, after a 6,000-year plan, Jesus is established in a peaceful kingdom with a heck of a lot to sort out, no doubt, because the world is it's not going to wave a wand, but ultimately he will sort it out. And so we start where we finished, or we finish where we started. Which is, this Gaza conflict is the third time that this has um, risen up. And at one time or other, this will spark the initial first round of Armageddon. Now it might not be this time. It might be another time. But I think all the pointers are, you know... It could well be this time. There's many reasons that we haven't got time to talk about as to why this could be the time. 
But if it is this time, then all this chain reaction of events are going to start being put into, into place and many, many, many prophecies that we've all been looking at will suddenly, one after the other, be fulfilled. And at some point between now and the, and the Lord Jesus Christ standing on the Mount of Olives, we will have been gathered together and judged by the Lord Jesus Christ. That, I think, is the order of events. <laughs>